Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome back for part two of Mesozoic Earth History. So now we're going to move on to the sedimentary sequences which affected North America during the Mesozoic. So the transition between the Permian and the Triassic is marked by the presence of the Absaroka sequence. So by the time we make it into the Triassic, the Absaroka is in full retreat. And we've already seen this diagram before. The Absaroka is going to start moving westwards and as it's retreating it obviously leaves behind isolated bodies of seawater which evaporate away to produce uh, some localized sequences of evaporites. Now the Epiric Sea of the Absaroka sequence uh, by the Triassic is pretty much limited to what is now North America's west coastal region and we have erosion taking place across the center and the eastern margins of North America. So the Absaroka Epiric Sea obviously peaked in the Permian and it was steadily regressing as we moved from the Permian into the Triassic and most of the movement was either westwards or southwestwards towards New Mexico and Texas. So the Absaroka is obviously located right here and we can begin to see as we move between the Permian and the Triassic we can see the Absaroka is actually retreating already. And as we come across into the uh, into the Triassic, there's actually another pulse. The Absaroka starts moving back inland. And then finally, as we are moving through the Triassic, we see the Absaroka is fully retreating. And we see North America is nearly fully exposed during the Jurassic. Now, as we uh, essentially at that point, we're going to have another marine transgressive event, which is going to cover over North America. And this is going to give us the Zuni sequence. So in terms of the Absaroka Sea itself, as we've already discussed, the large amounts of sediment which were coming off the erosion of the central and eastern portions of Laurentia meant the Absaroka Epiric Sea was dominated by detrital sediments. And of course, this had the effect of inhibiting carbonate formation in, in a big way, because obviously in order to form large amounts of carbonates, one of the things you really need is nice, clear water and of course the problem we're having at this point is the water in the Absaroka uh, Pyrrhic Sea would have been absolutely stuffed with fine suspended clays and silts in the sea water so the water is going to be quite murky. So this obviously differs significantly from the earlier uh, transgressive events which covered North America during the Paleozoic because of course we know that these Epiric Seas were essentially clear, shallow and warm and so they would have been perfect for carbonate formation. So we know the Soak, the Tipicanu and the Kaskaskia, they were all carbonate dominated seas. In terms of the Absaroka it was dominated by clastic sediments, mostly muds and sands. So what about the Zuni sequence? Well, the Zuni transgression begins in the Middle Jurassic and it extends all the way through into the early Paleogene, so it goes through into the Cenozoic. Now, like the Absaroka, it was not a complete transgression. So if you remember, the Sok, the Tippecanoe and the Kaskaskia pretty much resulted in all of the United States being underwater and a substantial portion of Canada being underwater. In the case of the Absaroka, we had large portions of the United States and Canada above sea level, and obviously this meant we could create large quantities of clastic sediments through erosion. And the same thing is going to happen during the Zuni transgression, so it doesn't cover over all of North America or Canada, so there's plenty of rock to be eroded, so there's plenty of clastic sediment moving around. Now, this, uh, the, the amount of clastic sediment moving around at this point is very, very high because we have the formation of the Rocky Mountains starting. And obviously, as you know, any elevated terrain is going to naturally erode quite quickly. So the formation of a mountain range is going to lead to large amounts of erosion and obviously the production of substantial quantities of clastic material. So the Zuni sequence uh, was driven by a transgressive event which was likely the result of mantle plume activity forcing spreading ridges upwards. So obviously we know that spreading ridges in the middle of the oceans, which we also refer to as divergent plate boundaries, actually are higher than the surrounding seafloor. They can be about one to one and a half kilometers higher than the seafloor either side. Now, this is primarily because underneath the ridge, we have large quantities of magma. And obviously, magma is naturally buoyant. It wants to rise. And so the, the upwards force of this magma wanting to rise pushes the crust up. 
Now, what we think was happening in the uh, in the Mesozoic is that these spreading ridges were becoming extremely active, which meant there was large quantities of magma trapped underneath the ridge. And by large, we mean huge quantities of magma. Now, this would have pushed the spreading ridges up even further. And obviously, as the spreading ridges get pushed up even more, they're going to displace seawater as they get pushed upwards. And obviously, that seawater has to go somewhere, so it has to encroach onto the land. And that's obviously going to lead to a marine transgression. So the Epiric Sea that's going to form is going to end up bisecting North America. So it's going to cut North America in two. So the formation of the Zuni sequence took place in two phases. So the first phase of the marine transgression produced what's called the Sundan Sea, and that was between the middle to late Jurassic. So the formation of the Sundan Sea was driven by a general global sea level rise, and obviously the ocean then moved onto the continents. Now, as we move into the late Jurassic, we begin to see the Sundance Sea retreating. Now, the retreat of the Sundance Sea is actually driven by the uh, Nevadian orogeny. And what this does is it starts to push up the western side of North America. And obviously, as it pushes up the terrain, the Sundance Sea, which is sitting on the continental crust, obviously gets pushed back out into the ocean basin. Now, as we move into the early Cretaceous, we have the second stage of the transgressive event, which produces the Cretaceous Interior Seaway, also sometimes called the Western Interior Seaway. And this forms between the early Cretaceous and the early Paleogene. Now, this transgressive event is driven by the change in height of the spreading ridges. And now we've already discussed, this is due to the trapping of large amounts of magma underneath these spreading ridges. And they actually push the spreading ridges up so far that we think it might have led to an increase in sea level of about 250 metres. So that's a very substantial increase in sea level. Now, obviously, this very you know, substantial sea level increase is going to lead to the seawater is going to lead to seawater transgressing back over the continents, and so even though the western side of North America is being pushed up due to subduction, it's still not enough to stop the sea coming back onto the land, and that's going to lead to the formation of the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. Now, at the end of the Cretaceous, or the end of the Cretaceous going into the early Paleogene, should I say, the spreading ridges begin to subside, so the amount of magma trapped under the ridges begins to drop. And this, of course, means that the spreading ridges begin to decrease in height. That means, essentially, the seawater is now being allowed to move back into the ocean basins, and we see the Zuni uh, transgression retreating. So... Here's our situation in the early Jurassic. So what can we see? Well, obviously, we've got Gondwana down here. We've got North America here, Europe's over here. And we can see we have the ridge beginning to form over here. We can see we have a subduction zone established along the western margin of North America. And we can see that we have the formation of the early uh, Rocky Mountains, the Proto Rockies down here. So as we move into the middle Jurassic, we can begin to see the Sundance Sea transgressing onto the continent of North America. We can see it starts off up here in the northwest and it steadily moves southwards into the central plains of North America. And we can see that it actually starts to bifurcate and go in two directions. One limb starts to take it down here towards what is now modern day California and the other limb starts to take it into the central US. Now, obviously, we can see the terrain which is being pushed up by the subduction zone over here does not get inundated because obviously it's higher than the seawater. So as we move into the late Cretaceous, we, uh, late Jurassic, sorry, I do apologize, we can see the Sundance Sea is now retreating. And this is because we have the uh, Nevadian orogeny taking place here along the western coast. And that's really pushing up this area of continental crust. So as this entire area starts to go up, obviously the seawater is forced to drain back into the ocean basin. So by the early Cretaceous, we can see we have the establishment of high ground over here, and we can see that the center of North America is dry. So there's been a more or less full regression of the Sundance Sea. 
So now as we move into the Cretaceous, we're going to see these spreading ridges being pushed upwards. That's going to displace seawater from both the Atlantic, the Arctic, and what will become the Pacific. And that seawater is now going to have to move somewhere, so it's got to go onto the land. And you can pretty much see the areas through which this uh, seawater is going to go, because you can see we have high ground here. We still have some high ground there and there, and a bit of high ground here as well. And so that means this area here is going to be the prime location for the marine transgression. So by the time we make it to 115 million years ago, so we're still in the early Cretaceous, we can see that uh, there's been a very large marine transgression. We can see that it's coming in from both the north and the south, and it's almost completely bifurcated North America. As you move into the middle Cretaceous, we can still see this body of water. It's still present. Remember, the spreading ridges are still up, up, so that's still displacing water onto the land. And then as you move into the late Cretaceous, you can see we have the most uh, extensive covering of North America during the Zuni transgression. So we have a complete bifurcation between the Arctic Ocean up here and the Gulf of Mexico down here. And we even have another limb which is coming off across what is now Hudson Bay into what is now the North Atlantic. By the late Cretaceous, so 65 million years ago, so the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, we can see that the uh, the Western Interior Seaway is now in complete retreat and it's heading southwards towards the Gulf of Mexico and northwards towards the Arctic Ocean. And of course, this is driven by a combination of subsiding seafloor spreading ridges and also the formation of some ice at the poles, which is helping to lock up water so it can't return to the ocean basins. So now we need to start thinking about the effects on global climate and ocean circulation patterns that the breakup of Pangaea is going to have during the Mesozoic. So by the end of the Permian, Pangaea extended pretty much from pole to pole. It covered about a quarter of the Earth's surface, and it was surrounded by a single massive ocean basin which contained the Panthalesan Ocean. Now, we also know there was also the Tethian Ocean Basin, which was located along the eastern margin of Pangaea, but that was noticeably smaller than Panthalassa. So, uh, a mixture of continental arrangement, ocean circulation patterns, and the mountain range location is going to lead to the production of arid conditions over a substantial portion of Pangaea, particularly in its interior. So as we move from the Permian in the, into the Triassic and Jurassic, what we see is that the interior of Pangaea is on the whole quite hot and dry, whilst the coastlines of Pangaea are also warm, but they are a lot more humid. So the world's climate is, of course, a reflection of wind patterns in the atmosphere, ocean currents in the ocean, and the location and topography of the continents, because we know the presence of high ground like mountain ranges is going to affect how the air moves in the atmosphere. So in general, we see the following patterns when talking about you know, ocean and atmospheric circulation. So the first pattern that we see is that dry climates occur on large land masses and in areas which are remote to sources of moisture. So a source of moisture would be the sea, an ocean, or maybe a large lake. And of course, this makes a lot of sense. The further you are from any source of moisture, well, that means any you know, wet air that's coming off that, that body of water, like the ocean, will obviously be moving inland. And the longer the journey it has to take, the more opportunity it has to lose that moisture. And so by the time the air makes it to the center of a large continent or to a remote area, essentially that air will have lost most of its humidity. So it'll be very, very dry. And so it won't offer much in the way of rain to that environment. Now, also, we're going to have dry areas forming where we have some kind of barrier to moist air. So that would be something like a mountain range. So as we've already touched on, as a mountain range gets hit by the air, the air has to do one of a couple of things. It can either try and go around the mountain range, which is a bit tricky, or it can try and go over the top. And normally it takes the second option. So as the air tries to rise over the top of the mountain range, obviously temperatures are going to decrease. This is going to uh, encourage the water in the air to begin to nucleate, so it's going to start forming precipitation. And so the water is going to leave the air in the form of rain or snow. 
And so this means by the time the air makes it over to the other side of the mountain, it will have dumped a substantial portion of its moisture. And so the air on the opposite side of the mountain will be quite dry. So once again, that air isn't going to offer much in the form of rainfall to the area on the opposite side of the mountain. Now, in terms of areas where we see a wet climate, well, unsurprisingly, we tend to find those environments near large bodies of water. So that's not really a huge shock. We also see them in areas where the prevailing wind direction will carry uh, moist air over the continents. Now, in both of those cases, not really surprising. Now, what we can do is we can infer past climatic conditions based on the presence of certain climate sensitive sedimentary rocks. So some of the things we might look for are rocks like the evaporites. So we know that evaporites will only form in areas where we have a restricted body of water, typically in arid conditions. So if we find evaporite horizons, we can say, right, the, the climate in this area was probably hot and dry. Same goes for red beds. So red sandstones are on the whole produced in arid or semi-arid regions. We would also obviously look for other features such as the presence of meter scale cross beds, asymmetrical ripples, maybe reptile uh, trackways or, or fossils. And we would combine all of that together to say, right, well, these rocks were clearly forming in a hot arid environment. Obviously, the presence of coal tells us that the environment was likely to have been very, very humid. The environment was likely to have been inundated with water. Now, the climate, the coal forming climates can either be hot or cold. However, most coal formation tends to take place in warm environments. So normally, if you see a layer of coal in your sedimentary sequence, chances are that layer of coal formed when the area in question was essentially uh, near the equator. So it was warm and it was partially inundated by the sea, obviously providing the, the very wet, humid conditions that you really want to form a, a good quality coal swamp. Finally, uh, the fourth type of rock that we'll keep an eye out for are limestones. So we've already touched on limestones several times, so we know by now that limestones like to form in shallow marine environments with clear, warm water possessing a normal salinity, and those environments are typically located 30 degrees north or south of the equator. So once again, when we find limestones, we know we're probably somewhere in this region, and it also gives us an idea about the climate. It's going to be quite hot, quite tropical. So when we start seeing these rocks, we can actually begin to infer what the climate was like in a certain area. Now in the Triassic, we see the deposition of extensive red beds with cross beds. So we can see there were dunes in the area, which would be expected in a desert environment. And we also see the appearance of large amounts of evaporite, once again, hinting at a hot and dry set of conditions. And we see these conditions in low, to middle latitude. So low essentially is near the equator to middle latitude, essentially what we might refer to as the temperate zone now. And we see this in North America, South America, Europe and Africa. And that indicates that these continents were located near the equator or just north or south of the equator and conditions were on the whole quite hot and quite dry. Now, in contrast, the Triassic sequences from higher latitudes, so that's towards the poles, indicate that conditions were on the whole more temperate to humid. So we see the appearance of coal beds in those areas, which would imply that conditions were, you know, on the whole, a lot wetter. So there was a lot more rain forming in those areas. And that's obviously going to lead to the formation of these large, you know, forests. And so those are going to produce quite large coal formations. Now, conditions would have been equivalent to modern day peat bogs for the former, so when the conditions are a bit more temperate, and tropical wetlands when the conditions are more humid. So, in a modern example, that would be somewhere like the Florida Everglades. So, what we can see is that as we get away from these dry conditions by the equator, we start to see the weather becoming more humid. Now, in some cases, obviously, the closer to the equator you are, that's going to be hot and humid, and the further away from the equator you move, obviously, temperatures are going to drop a little bit, so you're going to get more temperate humid conditions. In the more temperate humid conditions, you're going to form peat bogs, and in the more hot humid conditions, you're going to get tropical wetlands. Now, even if we have no direct sedimentary evidence, so we don't have any sedimentary rocks that can really tell us about the type of environment, 
we can infer the probable environment from the position of the continents and from the rocks that we find in proximal locations. So we can look at nearby rocks and we can say, right, well, these rocks are hinting at this type of environment. You know, would that be consistent with where the continents were located at that time and how we think, you know, seawater and the air was circulating? So a good example of this would be rocks throughout the Mesozoic show the uh, equatorial regions were warm and we have rock evidence to prove this. We also know that the northern and eastern margins of the Tethys Ocean Basin were relatively broad and relatively shallow warm seas and so we, and we have the carbonate deposits to prove it. So what we can do is we can then model how the water will have circulated within the Tethian Ocean Basin and how that would affect the weather patterns. So, you know, we know we know about the land, we know what was going on in the oceans, but there are some parts of the Tethian Ocean coastline where we don't have any rock samples, so we don't know exactly what was going on. But what we can do is we can say, right, well, we know what the conditions were like nearby. We know how the Tethian Basin was circulating water. We know, you know, it was approximately we can work out how that was happening. And so what we can do is we can make an educated prediction about the types of weather patterns we would expect to see in certain locations along the margin of the Tethian Ocean Basin. So even though we actually have little direct evidence to prove it, we can say that the northern and eastern boundaries of the Tethian Ocean were on the whole going to be hot and humid. There will have been quite uh, humid winds bringing essentially water-rich air off the ocean, and this will have caused seasonal monsoons. So we know this area will have been hot and humid throughout the year, will have been hit by uh, essentially a monsoon season occasionally, and these monsoons would have hit what is Pangaea's eastern coast, which would be the western margin of the Tethian Ocean Basin. So can we put any solid numbers to these changes in weather patterns which are going to be driven you know, by the shifting of the continent's positions? And the answer, to be honest, is no. Now, the temperature gradient between the tropics and the poles affects ocean and atmospheric circulation. Typically, the greater the difference in the temperature, obviously the higher the temperature gradient will be, and therefore the higher the rate of circulation will be. This goes for both the atmosphere and the oceans. So we know that the oceans absorb more solar radiation than the continents. So the oceans absorb about 90% of the solar radiation that hits them. The continents will only absorb about 50% of the solar radiation that hits them. So we know that areas which are dominated by the oceans tend to be warmer than those dominated by continents. And obviously this is a reflection of the fact that the oceans are naturally darker than the continents. Now, by knowing the position of the continents at a given time in the Earth's history, we can model ocean and atmospheric circulation and the effect that heat retention by the oceans has on the land masses. So we can produce estimates of the annual temperature ranges for regions on the Earth's surface. So uh, when we're in the Mesozoic, we see that on the whole, the Triassic and the Jurassic are relatively stable in terms of climate. Now, as we move into the Cretaceous, on the other hand, things begin to break down. Now, this is because we're starting to see the landmass consisting of North America, Europe and Asia is steadily moving northwards towards the North Pole. Obviously, as the continents move northwards, they displace seawater. This is obviously going to mean we're replacing something that retains 90% of the solar radiation with something that only retains about 50% of the solar radiation. So as the continents move northwards, we're going to see that driving down the temperatures towards the North Pole. The same thing is going to happen in the South Pole. So we're going to see Antarctica and Australia moving towards the South Pole, displacing seawater. And so that's going to cause the temperature at the South Pole to drop as well. So what this is going to do is it's obviously going to increase the temperature gradient between the equator and the pole, and this is going to lead to higher rates of circulation. So what we begin to see is we begin to see a change in the annual temperature in the northern hemisphere, especially beginning in the Cretaceous. And we also see the establishment of seasons. So we start to see differences in the yearly weather pattern. So we can begin to infer the presence of relatively warm summers and colder, wetter winter periods.
So the breakup of Pangaea will of course also produce changes in wind and ocean current patterns. So if we look here, this is our situation in the Triassic. You can see we have our supercontinent of Pangaea, and we can see we have this large ocean basin, the Panthalassic Ocean Basin, and of course we have the Tethyan Ocean Basin right here. And we can see that because the continents are all lined up in one location, we have completely free ocean circulation everywhere else. And so this means that you can take warm water from the equator and you can move it towards the poles relatively easily. And so what this means is because we have this uninhibited flow of warm water from the equator to higher latitudes, it means water which we would now consider to be quite cold would, at least in the early Paleozoic, in the early Mesozoic, sorry, have actually been relatively warm. So when we combine the changes in ocean circulation pattern with the more rapid circulation produced by an increased temperature gradient, which we see mostly in the Cretaceous, it's going to lead to the formation of more chaotic weather systems. And this is obviously going to produce more seasonal variation. So this is where these warm summers come from and cold, wet winters. And we can see this when we start looking at the Cretaceous here. So when you when you look, you can see yes, we still have you know a relatively free circulation of water in the Pacific region. But when we look at the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and this body of water here between Africa, India, and Eurasia, we can see that we now have isolated bodies of water that are starting to circulate just within themselves. And so this means we start to set up localized weather patterns. And so instead of this more homogeneous global weather system, which we have during the Triassic and also into the Jurassic, as we move into the Cretaceous, we, saw, we see more chaotic weather systems, and we we see weather becoming more localized. So although there was a temperature decrease in the higher latitudes, and we've discussed that's because we have continental crust moving northwards and southwards, displacing seawater, it was offset by to some degree by the circulation of warm water from the Tethys Sea. So we can see at this point, even though we're displacing seawater, the water in this area is still being kept warm-ish by warm water coming in from the Tethys Ocean Basin here and essentially moving into what is now the modern day North Atlantic. And of course, we also have water circulating down here towards what is now the modern day South Atlantic and Southern Indian Ocean. So that's helping to keep these areas artificially warmer than they otherwise would have been. Now, obviously, once Africa begins to interact with uh, Eurasia, obviously this particular uh, route here is going to be stopped. Obviously, once South, South America and North America interact with each other and uh, form one landmass, obviously it's going to stop this circulation here as well. And so once these land masses come together, essentially we're going to end up with several isolated basins. So we're going to have the Atlantic Basin here. We're going to have the Indian Ocean Basin here. We're going to have the Pacific Ocean Basin here, and we're going to have the circumpolar current circulating around Antarctica down here. And each of these bodies of water is going to operate independently of each other, and they're going to produce their own localized weather patterns. Now, the movement of uh, movement of air in the atmosphere. Uh, with the continents in their current position is also going to affect what areas of the world are going to be hot and what areas of the world are going to be dry. Now, if we look at this diagram up here, this diagram is showing you the location of the major deserts on the surface of the Earth. Now, we know that the Arctic Desert and the Antarctic Desert down here are primarily there due to the very, very cold temperatures. Now, in terms of this band here, that includes uh, areas like they like the uh, Moave and uh, the Sahara. We can see we have a band of deserts stretching across like so. Now it just so happens if you look here and you look at how the air is circulating, we can see that this band is falling along here at approximately 30 degrees. Now, if you look at the air patterns, what you'll notice is air is being removed from these areas and it's moving northwards towards the poles and southwards towards the equator. So what's happening is, is the air is being removed from, from these locations and it's taking what little moisture there is with it. And so that's helping to keep this band here artificially dry. Now, in terms of areas which are far away from the coastline, so we have areas like the Gobi Desert of Asia, or the Colorado Plateau of North America, well, these areas are going to be affected by both topography and the distance to the coast. 
And so these areas are going to be away from sources of water, and so we're going to see the establishments of uh, desert environments in these very, very deep continental environments. Now, on the south side of the equator, we're going to see exactly the same band forming. So here's 30 degrees south of the equator. We can see that it's lining up quite nicely with deserts like the Kalahari and, of course, the Australian deserts as well. And this, once again, is the result of air movement away from these areas towards both the equator and the poles. And essentially, this is helping to remove the, the any humid area in that area. It's taking it away. And so that means the air in these bands are becoming artificially dry. And of course, that's going to lead to desert formation. So now let's think about what was going on with North America in the Mesozoic. So conditions in the early Mesozoic for North America were a continuation of those experienced in the Permian. On the whole, pretty hot and pretty arid. So terrestrial sedimentation persisted, although we get some rifting occurring and volcanism uh, as North America begins to separate from Africa and South America along what is now the modern day Appalachian Mobile Belt. And so we see a restricted basin forms in the Gulf of Mexico region and the arid climate obviously causes this restricted basin to begin to evaporate away so we lose lots of the water and obviously that's going to lead to large scale evaporite formation and this is going to occur in the late Triassic and Jurassic. We're going to see, of course, that global sea level rise in the Cretaceous. That's obviously going to lead to major marine transgressions, and that's going to produce the Cretaceous Interior Seaway, and of course the deposition of sediments associated with the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. So on the western coast of North America, we're going to see a Permian-aged volcanic island arc system suture itself along the west coast of North America during the late Permian to early Jurassic. And this is going to give us the Sonoma orogeny. So what we're looking at is the uh, Cordelian region underwent a series of orogenies which are going to produce the Sierra Nevada the Rocky Mountains and other lesser mountain chains along the western side of North America. And this is all going to be going on during the Mesozoic. And of course, as we've already touched on, high ground tends to get eroded quite quickly. So the formation of a mountain range or mountain ranges is obviously going to produce large amounts of erosion and large amounts of clastic sediment. So these orogenic events are often bundled together and they're, uh, they're classified as the uh, Cordelian uh, orogeny. So let's start by thinking about the continental interior during the Mesozoic. So during the Paleozoic, there were four marine transgressions. Of course, we have the Sok, the Tipicanoo, the Kazkaskia, and the Absaroka. Of course, we know by now the Absaroka actually straddles the boundary between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. So the resulting empiric seas deposited unconformity-bound sedimentary sequences across Laurentia. We know that. That's fine. Now, we know that these marine transgressions are far less important in the Mesozoic, where the, continent, where the continental interior for North America on the whole remains above sea level. Now, we also know that the Mesozoic uh, North American Craton is obviously going to be affected by two marine transgressions. We've got what's left of the Absaroka sequence, which occurs between the Middle Carboniferous and Early Jurassic. And of course, we have the second uh, marine transgressive event, which occurs during the Mesozoic, that produces the Zuni sequence. And that's between the Early Jurassic and the Early Paleocene. And we know that happens in two phases. The first phase is the Sundance Sea, and the second phase creates the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. Now, neither of these transgressions, the Absaroka or the Zuni, actually manages to fully inundate the continent of North America to anywhere near the same level as we saw in the Paleozoic events. So this obviously means plenty of North America is above sea level. That means plenty of North America is available to be eroded. Plus, obviously, we have all of this high ground on the western side of North America. And all of, the, all of that combined is going to produce huge amounts of sediments which are going to be moving across the continents and into ocean basins. So what's happening during the well, along the eastern coastal region during the Mesozoic? So during the early and middle Triassic, we get coarse detrital sediments produced by the erosion of the Appalachian Mobile Belt. 
So if you remember, we have the Allegheny orogeny, which essentially finishes in the very early Permian. And of course, that's created a set of mountains which are akin to the size of the Himalayas. And of course, during the Mesozoic, those mountains are going to be steadily eroded away, producing large amounts of sediment in the process. And of course, this sediment is going to go across the continental interior of North America, and it's also going to be deposited along what will become the eastern coastline of North America. So, uh, as I said, continued erosion of the Appalachian Mobile Belt reduces this once Himalayan scale mountain range to essentially a set of gently undulating hills by the Jurassic and a flat plain by the Cretaceous. Now, in the late Triassic, we begin to see crustal extension due to the mantle upwellings underneath Pangaea, and this starts to cause the crust to rift. So the crust begins to enter extension, so it's being stretched. And as we know, you can only stretch rock so far before it starts to break. Now, when we look at the location of the rocks associated with this rifting, what we can see is we can see them here as these orange areas. We can see them extending from Canada down the eastern side of North America. And this is giving us essentially the approximate orientation of the rift zone. You can see it's orientated approximately northeast southwest. So the faulting that produces this rifting uh, will lead to the formation of a rift valley. Now, if we look over here, we can see a, a picture of what a rift valley typically looks like. So we have these big fault bound blocks of rock. So they've got normal faults either side. And obviously movements along the normal fault will cause one block to drop down relative to another block. So if we look at this diagram here, we can see this block has dropped down relative to this block. This block has dropped down relative to this block, this block relative to that block and so on. And so what you'll notice is we have this very, very distinctive stepped terrain. And we can see that here in this picture. So here's step number one. So this face here is going to be a fault. So that's step one. Then we have another step here. This is going to be fault number two. And then we're actually standing on top of one of the fault bound blocks here. And so what we see along what is now the modern day east coast of North America is we see a rift valley just like this forming. So we see the formation of normal faults. This obviously causes the crust to drop. And this obviously creates depressions which will begin to fill with coarse plastic sediment. Now the sediment is relatively coarse because what happens is, is of course, as the ground begins to drop, you end up creating high ground. And high ground naturally erodes faster than lower ground. So these higher portions of the rift valley will erode and they will produce sediment that gets deposited into the rift valley. So the sediment being produced is a mixture of uh, red terrestrial sediments and they're pretty poorly sorted. So it's a mixture of uh, conglomerates and quite coarse sandstones called arcoses. So the red colour is highly uh, probably, probably caused by the fact that these sediments are being deposited into arid or semi-arid conditions. And of course, as we've discussed, this isn't a huge surprise because the area which is now the, mo the modern east coast of North America would have been pretty much you know, right in the center of the northern portion of Pangaea. So conditions would have been surprisingly dry. So this mixture of sandstones and conglomerates is referred to as the Newark group and it forms most of the sedimentary fill which goes into the Rift Valley. Now, also because we're thinning the continental crust here, that will lead to uh, the partial melting of the underlying mantle. We also have the presence of mantle plumes underneath this region as well. So both of those are going to contain mafic magma. And so some of that mafic magma is going to make its way towards the surface using the faults as conduits. And so we're going to see the emplacement of numerous dikes and sills within the Newark sequence. And all of this is indicative of rifting. So after the initial coarse rifting, we're then gonna get a continued extension and this is going to lead to the formation of smaller fault bound blocks like you can see here. 
So the deposition of much of the Newark group started in the late Triassic when the Rift Valley really began to establish itself. So remember, although rifting began in the early Triassic, we don't really see a, a particularly pronounced surface expression of that rifting until the late Triassic. And obviously, in order to produce most of the Newark group sediments, we need the high ground to be you know, there to be eroded. And so we don't get the high ground until the late Triassic. Now, we actually get some areas of the Newark group aren't actually being deposited until the early Jurassic, and that's because the Rift Valley didn't just open in one event. It was a, uh, it was a steady uh, opening, a bit, like, uh, a bit like undoing a zipper. So this likely reflected the opening of new valleys within pre-existing the Rift or the opening of new portions of the Rift as it grew, as I just said. Now, as well as the detrital sediments, these sandstones and conglomerates, we obviously have the emplacement of lava flows, and these lava flows are going to be mafix, they're going to be basalts, and we're going to have the emplacement, obviously, of dikes and sills within the uh, Newark group itself. That represents, essentially, the plumbing, which is bringing the lava to the surface so it can be erupted. So... Uh, as the rift widened, eventually the margins of the rift became passive continental margins, and the rift itself began to fill with seawater. Eventually we had the formation of a spreading ridge in the middle of the rift, at which point oceanic crust started to be made, and that's when we have the Atlantic forming. So by the early Cretaceous, along the east coast, the highlands were gone, so we had, you know, the, uh, the Appalachians had been reduced to a, a set of gently undulating hills. However, by uh, in the middle Cretaceous, we begin to see the Appalachian area actually begins to be uplifted a little bit. And this produces a new round of erosion which deposits an additional 3,000 metres of sediments onto the passive margin that becomes established along what is now the modern day east coast. So just to give you some idea, so these are the sediments of the Newark group here. You can see it's a mixture of uh, horizontally bedded red sandstones and also uh, you know, quite fine red conglomerates. But within them, you can see we have this. So this is a sill. This is a palisade sill. And this is you know, going to consist of um, mafic igneous rocks. So this represents essentially a conduit through which magma was moving in an attempt to make it to the surface so it could be erupted and obviously form basalts. So now let's move on to the Gulf Coast region. So the Gulf Coast region was above sea level for much of the Triassic, as it was a highland area which had been created by the Achetan orogeny. Now, the rifting that began along the east coast of what is now North America uh, in the early Triassic was, of course, being expressed in the form of a rift valley by the late Triassic. Now, the formation of this rift valley in the Gulf Coast area didn't actually take place until the early Jurassic. And that's because the rift valley didn't just open up in one event. It was a progressive opening of the rift valley, which started in the northeast and then moved down towards the southwest. Now, once we actually have rifting taking place in the Gulf Coast region, the rift valley that's formed very rapidly fills with seawater from the Panthalatic Ocean. And this is because the what is now the modern day Gulf Coast area was quite close to the coastline of Pangaea. And so it didn't take much of a depression to form before seawater could start moving in. Now, this led to the formation of approximately 1,000 metres of evaporites because obviously the body of water that you formed was relatively shallow and it was being essentially, and it was forming in an area which was very, very hot and very, very dry. So obviously you had lots of evaporation. So you can actually see some of these evaporites which formed during the Mesozoic as part of this video here. So this is a video where we have some scientists looking at the seafloor of the Gulf of Mexico and one of the things you'll see is you'll see there are locations where these uh, Mesozoic evaporites have been pushed up above sea level and it's leading to the formation of hypersaline seawater as the uh, the salts which were which were within these evaporites are beginning to dissolve into the seawater making it extremely salty. So by the late Jurassic, the rifting had opened the basin further, allowing for complete circulation within the Gulf and with the Panthalatic Ocean. So we have evaporite formation ceasing at this point because we have a steady flow of fresh water into the Gulf Coast area. So of course, that obviously means that any water that evaporates away is being replaced and so evaporite deposition will stop. <laughs> 
Now, during the Jurassic, the Gulf became a passive continental margin, and we have sediments being eroded from what's left of the Achetan Highlands to the north, and they were being deposited along the shelf. So the Jurassic sequence displays several cycles of fascist changes caused by minor marine transgressions and regressions. So we're seeing during the Jurassic, we're seeing the sea level is, is moving up and down, and essentially we're seeing the coastline move backwards and forwards because of that, and we're seeing the, the shifting of the fascies uh, every time one of these marine transgressions or regressions occurs. So during the early Cretaceous, the Gulf region, like much of the western margin, was flooded by a northward transgressive sea covering the shelf fasces with deep marine muds. So this is obviously going to be, you know, one of the first stages of the, uh, the uh, formation of the Cretaceous interior seaway. Now, this initial stage was actually then followed by a marine regression. So the sea actually moved back off the land during the early Cretaceous, and then it's re once that retreat stopped, it was then followed by a very fast marine transgressive event. And this gives us the Cretaceous interior seaway that's going to bisect North America from the uh, Arctic Ocean in the north down to the Gulf in the south. So... Once we have uh, the Cretaceous Interior Seaway being established, the modern Gulf Coast region is a relatively shallow body of water with depths typically between about 0 and 200 metres. So pretty good conditions if you want to try and form carbonates. So here we go. So we're down here in the newly formed Gulf of Mexico, and we have a body of water which stretches from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to the Arctic. Now, this diagram here is for the Sundance Sea, but of course this would be just as correct for the Cretaceous Interior Seaway as well. So during the Cretaceous, the Gulf region was an excellent environment for reef building. So we had warm water, it was shallow, it was pretty clear, we're 30 degrees north or south of the equator, you can't really ask for much more. So the reefs that formed were dominantly uh, made up of bivalves called rudists, so here's a rudist right here. So if you remember, bivalves tend to have two valves, two halves of the shell, which are mirror images of one another. You can quite clearly see in this instance, that's not the case. So every once in a while, that rule of thumb that says a bivalve will have, you know, uh, valves which are mirrors, mirror images of one another, is incorrect. So rudists can occur either by themselves, they can be isolated, or they can be colonial organisms. And essentially, rudists will range in size from a few centimeters up to about a meter for the largest uh, for the largest members of that particular group. And so they can create very, very extensive reef communities going on for tens or hundreds of kilometers in length, and they can be hundreds of meters in height. So due to the large size of most rudists, it actually ends up with uh, the formation of a highly porous limestone because the reef, uh, the reef sediment is just a mixture of mostly rudist uh, fossils. And so, so these rudist skeletons, they just fall over. They're all randomly orientated and because they're so big, it means you get big gaps in between them. And that means that what you end up with is a very, very, is a very, very porous limestone. And this limestone is an excellent uh, reservoir for hydrocarbons, so oil and gas. And so just so you can see here, we have a, a, a pair of rudists. We have one over here and one over here. So in this one, you can actually see the top of the rudis has been lost. So you can see the edge of the shell here coming around there. And in this case, you can actually see the lid of the rudist. You can see it as this honeycomb like structure. So part of it's been lost, but you can just about see what's left. And this is a particularly good example here where you can see the, the horn shaped lower valve and this flatter valve, which essentially forms the lid. So in terms of the, the general breakdown for the Gulf Coast region during the Mesozoic, so obviously this is going to be uh, the area to the north, and this is obviously going to be towards the south. So what we have here is we have a sequence of carbonate lagoon sediments. So we have a mixture of, uh, of fossiliferous limestones, mollusk limestones. We have uh, a, some sequences of, um, of carbonate mudflats. 
We then obviously have our carbonate barrier, which is going to be our reef, which is going to be made of these rudis. And then in front of it, of course, we're going to have our continental shelf sediments, which once again, because this area is dominated by carbonates, the carbonate shelf sediments are also going to be dominated by carbonates, where because materials are going to be coming off the carbonate shelf down the continental shelf here. So finally, for sedimentation, what about the western region of North America during the Mesozoic? Well, with the exception of the east coast rifting uh, that began forming in the late Triassic, all the major Mesozoic tectonism was focused along North America's west coast. Okay, So that's referred to as the uh, Cordelian uh, Mobile Belt. So the west coast was also the site of two major seaways, one during the Jurassic, one during the Cretaceous. So we have, the, of course, the, uh, the Sundance Sea and the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. So what we have is a situation where we have a large quantity of high ground here, which is going to be actively eroded, producing large amounts of sediments. Now, the western margin of this high ground is, of course, going to be an active continental margin. So sedimentary deposition is going to be you know, not particularly great in that area because the area is going to obviously be very active, lots of earthquakes, lots of volcanic activity. On the western side, so the eastern side on the other hand, we're going to have a passive margin. And of course that passive margin is going to go straight into either the Sundance Sea or the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. So what we're going to see is we're going to see a line of quite coarse uh, continental sediments, which are being formed by the erosion of the high ground here. And then we're going to see a, a selection of you know, clastic dominated sediments being deposited into the Sundance Sea or the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. So we're going to see this area being filled with lots of sandstones and mudstones and maybe in some areas which are well away from the, the clastic sediment we may get some carbonates forming. A good area for that would be somewhere down here like the Gulf Coast region which as you can see is a, a pretty fair distance from any source of clastic sediment so the water quality down here is on the whole quite good. Okay, everybody, so that's going to be it for part two. So please stop the video, get up, have a walk around, get a glass of water, take 10 minutes to relax, and then please come back for part three.